Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, I'll teach you how to find uh, the equilibrium concentrations after a reaction has reached dynamic equilibrium. And these are the most common types of problems you will run into when you're doing equilibrium problems. So not only for this chapter, but for the future chapters, where we'll utilize Ka and Kb, Ksp and Kf. Many times I'm asking you, find the equilibrium concentration. So this, these next few videos are really important to master, like how to approach these problems. All right, let's get started. So this question is asking us to considering the following reaction. It gives us the Kc. So that means we're working in concentration units. And it tells us that if the reaction mixture initially, and I always like to highlight that word initially, contains 0.175 molar of SO2Cl2, what is the equilibrium concentration of chlorine gas at 227 degrees Celsius? So remember how I said that when you see equilibrium, like what is equilibrium concentration, I want you to think about rice tables. So I've talked about rice tables in a previous video, giving you a very basic overview. Now we're going to actually work um, a pretty lengthy rice table together. And the reason why I want you to think rice table is because we see in the context of the problem that we're given an initial condition and we are asked to find equilibrium. Remember, R stands for reaction, that's always given, and change is something we determine based on the balanced chemical reaction. So once again, if it says, what is the equilibrium concentration of a species in a reaction? Think rice table. Okay, so I will write down my reaction again. That's the R part of my race table. The next part is, are the initial conditions, and we were only given that we put into our beaker 0.175 molar, or into our clothes container, since we're working with gases here. A lot of times I say beaker. Um, in the future videos, I'll say, what's in my beaker? So um, that's why I'm gonna be using that terminology throughout. It doesn't say we put any of the products in initially, so we can assume that they're zero molar. Now, how do these change over time? Well, the reactant, SO2Cl2, should be decreasing. And so we represent that by minus 1x. Remember that we must take into account the stoichiometric coefficient. And so I'm very mindful to write the 1 even though that's not actually necessary here. Um, but I do that because I've seen students forget that if there's a two in front of there to put the two in there. And so I will always be mindful to keep that stoichiometric coefficient, even if it's one, as a gentle reminder that that's important. And then products should be increasing. So it's a plus one X, that's how it's changing over time. And same with the chlorine gas. All right, so remember to find the equilibrium concentrations. We need to add the initial plus the change for each of them. And so this one is 0.175, the reactant. And then when you add a negative 1x, it's minus 1x. And then the sulfur dioxide is 0 plus 1x, so then it just ends up being 1x. And same for chlorine gas, 1x. All right. <clears throat> now we're also provided the equilibrium constant. And this is where I said make sure you know how to derive the equilibrium constant expression. 
because correctly because if you don't then the rest of this problem will not work out so remember to derive the expression for a reaction it's always what over what good products over reactants so that's the first thing you want to do is just write the expression out I always write EQ to remind myself that only equilibrium concentrations go into the equilibrium constant expression. And therefore I can plug that in. I see that I have one X times one X. I'm plugging in the ex, you know, the algebra equations at equilibrium into my equilibrium constant expression. And this is point one seven five minus one x. And so as you can imagine, <laughs> and hopefully you can start to see here that in the end, my goal is to always solve for x, right? Because once I know x, I can figure out my equilibrium concentrations. However, you know, I'm going to teach you a trick in this video here sometimes x is small enough to ignore. If we were to look at this and solve it, we would need to use the quadratic equation. This would turn into x squared, and then you know you could set up the quadratic, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, and then solve for x, and that's fine, but I always wanna teach you shortcuts um, if it's possible to kind of help speed up working through that problem. Sometimes we can't take it, in the next video I'll show you when x is just not small enough to ignore. So we have to use the, um, the quadratic equation or in a later video, I'll teach you about method of successive approximations when we don't have a quadratic, but maybe have a polynomial instead, okay? So we know that this equilibrium constant that was given to us is equal to 2.99 times 10 to the negative seventh. I'm going to always use a different color pen. I'm gonna say, well, if X is small enough to ignore, that means it's almost zero. And if we look at 0.175 minus zero, or a very small number, we can just ignore this term and that will make the math so much easier. So anytime you see a minus one X or a minus two X or plus two X or whatever, and you're trying to use this trick, you know, assume X is small enough to ignore, then just cross it out and then solve for X. And so here, this would be X squared. So it's only when you add or subtract X and it can have a coefficient in front of it. What you're saying here is that it's small enough to ignore, it's almost zero. So if you're adding zero or subtracting zero, then you can ignore it essentially, right? So that's that trick there. So let's continue to use it. So assume X is small enough to ignore then we have 2.99 times 10 to the negative seventh is equal to, and I'm just multiplying one X times one X, which is X squared over 0.175. Now, when we look at that algebra equation, we're like, this is a way more manageable. If we solve for X squared, we multiply both sides by 0.175. And then if we take the square root to solve for x, x is equal to 2.2874 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now, our question here is, is x small enough to ignore, right? You always wanna to check to make sure that it's safe to make that assumption. The way to check yourself is to ensure that x is less than 5% of initial value. So how you do that is you divide by the initial concentration 0.175 
times 100% because we're just converting it into a percentage. And the answer I get is 0.13%. So what this says is that x, this value here, is only 0.13% of what we put in, 0.175. It's less than 5%, so x is definitely small enough to ignore. It's, it's pretty, pretty negligible here in that sense. So let me write that down. So if x is less than 5% of the initial concentration then it's small enough to ignore All right, so now we have a value for x. Let me go ahead and highlight that. It's 2.2874 times 10 to the negative fourth. You know, I love to keep my significant figures until the very end. Um, the question's asking us, what is the equilibrium concentration of the chlorine gas? I'm just gonna do it for all of the species. Um, in the, in the solution, just so you can see how to derive the equilibrium concentration of the reactant as well. So the chlorine at equilibrium is equal to 1 times x, and so therefore that's 2.29 times 10 to the negative fourth molar. Same goes for the sulfur dioxide. And the reactant is equal to 0 0.175 minus x. And that's essentially just 0.175. Alright, so we ask ourselves always this question. We don't just plug and chug, but we want to make sure that our answer makes logical sense. Right, so always ask yourself, does the answer make sense? Based on your theory and, and foundation of these concepts. So in an earlier video, we learned about the trends of what the equilibrium constant actually tells us. We know that if the equilibrium constant is a lot less than one, and in this case it is a lot less than one, then what does it favor? Excellent, it favors reactants. So once your reaction has reached dynamic equilibrium, based on the equilibrium constant from the literature, we would expect that we should have a higher concentration of the reactant than we would of the products. So having that knowledge, look at what you've done with your calculations and compare. The products are significantly lower in concentration than the reactants once they've reached equilibrium. So yes, we expect more. More reactants than products.
at dynamic equilibrium. So our answer, our data does suggest that this is the case, right? Because we have 0.175 of the reactants still left over um, once we reach dynamic equilibrium. So once again, always ensure that the calculations, the data you've analyzed makes sense based on the theory that you know, right? About the trends of equilibrium constant and what you hypothesize will be left over once dynamic equilibrium is reached. Doing this will save you from making any kind of algebra mistakes or calculator mistakes. Um, if you get the opposite, um, and, you know, let's say we had more products than reactants, and we think to ourselves, what's happened here? Let me go back, let me check my expression, let me check my algebra to make sure that I, you know, didn't make a mistake in the setup. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.